where we are looking at breathing with both lungs, east and west, but with a particular emphasis on Eastern Christianity, particularly in the Byzantine tradition, uh, which is the tradition of this parish within this archdiocese. So I thought I would look today at the um, celebrations of significance that took place since our last meeting that are common to East and West, that the West celebrates, but which they largely borrowed liturgically from the East, from the Byzantine East. And those would be the ones that I've listed here. August 6th, August 15th, September 8th, and September 14th. For the last two years, I've been celebrating these, well, they vary depending upon the church, whether it's a feast or a great feast, whatever, uh, at the same time. And that can be rather exhausting. So our parish, as of post Pascha after Easter of this year, has gone to the Julian calendar, the same calendar, liturgical calendar, that is used by the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia and other Byzantine or Orthodox churches. So it's the old calendar, not the revised, or especially the Gregorian calendar. So instead of having August 6th where I would do one or two Roman Masses and then have had Great Vespers the night before here and then the Divine Liturgy in the evening here, kind of a long day, thank you very much. Um, now our celebrations are, are what, what is it, 14 days? 13 days. 13 days after the Roman or Gregorian celebration. When I was a hospital chaplain um, for years, over 11 years, I would sometimes visit people two days after I had seen them and anointed them. And I'd say, would you like the anointing again? And, and uh, They'd say, well, you just anointed me two or three days ago. And I said, well, you know what? God will give you a double scoop. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love a double scoop of ice cream when I was a kid going into the ice cream parlor. So, so God uh, gives me a double scoop because without too, ex too much exhaustion, when it's all at once, it's too much. But if there's a break, uh, on the Roman calendar, on the Gregorian calendar, I celebrate the 6th, the 15th, the 8th, and the 14th of these feasts. The Transfiguration of the Lord, August 15th, in the West known as the Assumption. The 8th is the birth or nativity of the Mother of God. The 14th is the Exaltation, sometimes known as the Triumph of the Holy Cross. For us, for our calendar here, and by the way, we'll be getting new calendars. Deacon Curl was just telling me this will be coming for the new year. This will show you um, the day on which we celebrate those feasts. And in the upper corner here, it will say the date in the Gregorian calendar. So, for example, with our new uh, celebrations, these feasts, uh, let's go to September or to August here. So, August 6th. We celebrated in the Roman calendar the Transfiguration, but in our calendar, in the Byzantine Julian calendar here in this parish, we celebrated the Transfiguration on the 19th of August. The Dormition, which is our name for the Assumption of the Mother of God, the word Dormition means falling asleep, the passing from one state to the next, falling asleep and passing from this light to the next of the Theotokos, the Mother of God. We celebrated that on August 28th. And then the Nativity of the Mother of God, we celebrated on September 21st. Okay, so September 21st for this. And the 28th for this. And the 19th for this, and then last Sunday on the 27th, we celebrated the exaltation of the Holy Cross. Okay, so 
a lot has happened in the summer, September, August and September in particular, um, for me, double for each of these feasts. In the Roman calendar, these are feasts or solemnities. This is a solemnity, uh, this is a feast, uh, this is a feast, and this is a feast. Uh, and in the Byzantine liturgical calendar, we don't have those subdivisions. In the Roman church, they used to have doubles of the first class and all of these more complicated liturgical divisions of feasts. Um, and, and now we have, in the Roman church, memorials, optional or obligatory, feasts and solemnities. The Byzantine liturgical calendar has 12 major or great feasts throughout the year. Those feasts would be the equivalent of solemnity, somewhere between a feast and a, and a, and a solemnity, a solemn feast in the Roman church. Okay, so a number of those took place during the last time that we were, that we were um, meeting uh, for our first Saturday lectures. So what I thought I would do is talk about Transfiguration, Dormition, Nativity, and Exaltation of the Holy Cross. Now, oh, hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Come on in. Can I sit up front? Sure, sure, sure. Do I Let's stand see. in the corner? You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to stand in the corner. Thank Let's you, see. Sir. There you go. Do you want another chair? That would be good. Where do you want it? It's right here. Okay. Better. Good. Good. Super. So, not taking them each individually per se, but looking at, since we last met, what has happened liturgically in the Byzantine Church, and what does the liturgy say to us, not just in terms of ritual and rubrics, but in terms of our spirituality. Spirituality meaning who you are in the real world, in real time. What, what, how does this affect you? One of the great temptations of Byzantine Christianity, there are two temptations actually, one has to do with doctrine and the other has to do with liturgy. The first temptation with regards to doctrine is to make it all cerebral, to make everything an abstract concept so that religion becomes the equivalent of engineering or math or science. And if you get the right answer, you're okay, you're going to heaven. <laughs> mm. Okay, <laughs> need to go a little further than that. Liturgy becomes ritual formalism. If you get the rubrics down, you're going to heaven. Mm. Is that the Gospels, really? What we need to do is look at the heart of the Gospels. Our spirituality starts with who we are in the real time, real world. Who are you? Where are you? As Pope Francis says, that's where you encounter the Lord. Okay? Okay. We don't start with the ethereal, the abstract, the conceptual, or with ritual formalism, rubrics alone. We start with the encounter with the Lord. One of the things that was common in um, the Pope's visit last week was the politicization of Catholicism, of Catholic Christianity. Um, and of course the translation, the attempt to translate Christianity into secular socio-economic and political categories which always fall short because one group say the Democratic Party is going to emphasize a particular set of values the Republican Party is going to set represent another set of values and then boom 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 it's the battle of the Giants who claims religion for their own and the, and the answer is neither of you <laughs> Because neither of you get it completely, completely. Byzantine Christi Christianity at its best attempts to go back to the heart of the matter, the origins, the apostolic origins of classical Christianity. What are those origins? Let's word it a different way. Who, who is that origin? Christ, the Lord. And so what, what synthesizes these liturgical celebrations which have taken place since we last met is 
the central mystery, the heart of Christianity, which defines Christianity, as a, d defines it as a distinct world religion, which is incarnation. Incarnation. Again, not as an abstract concept, not as a dogma, but as the starting point of my spiritual life where I encounter the Lord. The word theotokos here is roughly translated from the Greek meaning mother of God, but the more accurate translation is the birth giver of the one who is God. He is God. Who did she give birth to? Person, capital P. Who unites in himself as person two distinct, distinct but inseparable natures, divine and human. To say that she simply gave birth to the human nature is to turn Christ into a, a, a monstrosity. Mothers don't give birth to a nature. What's a nature? It's something, some abnormal or some, some, some concept. No, she gives birth to a person, but in the case of her child, this person is person capital P. What did we say in the Divine Liturgy today? Only begotten Son, immortal Word, immortal Word of the Father. And so she is the birth giver of the one who is God. One of the things that people want to do with religion is to say, let's get down to earth. Let's make it real. But if you make it real without God, all you have is religion as a nonprofit organization. And it's either engaged in endless culture wars over medical and sexual ethics issues, or it satisfies itself only with temporal, socioeconomic, and political issues. The sum total of religion is climate control, whether the weather, you know, working for the environment youth unemployment, immigrants, refugees, etc. Are those important issues? Yes. Are they a fruit of gospel living? Yes. Are they a replacement for the gospel? No. <laughs> no. 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 Because you can do those things without mentioning Christ. For Christians, Christ is the center who unites, is the origin, the source, and ultimate terminal point or goal of everything else that we're all about. And if we don't get that, then we don't get Christianity. Go back to square one and get rebaptized, re so to speak. You know? And for a lot of people, that's hard to get because they get all caught up on these other issues and they haven't gotten the basics down first. So the central point of all of these feasts, these beautiful feasts, is the mystery of Christ, the person of Christ. Talk about God getting down to earth. There's nothing more getting down to earth uh, than, than, than this, the exaltation of the cross, which we talked about today in the gospel, where the, in the homily, where the gospel is still within the celebration of the Holy Cross, the leave-taking, what we call uh, uh, after feast, leave-taking of the Holy Cross is tomorrow. So we're still talking about the cross that we celebrated, the exaltation of the cross last Sunday. And so if people are saying, you know, where is God in my religious faith and my spirituality? Where is God? God is in the mystery of the cross. What is the cross? The cross is everything that you endure in this life that could be a sense of pain, sorrow, suffering, alienation, everything that is the yes but not yet in your life that causes frustration and, and causes hope, but also the recognition that we are not there yet. So the Lord takes all of that upon himself in the mystery of the cross. He takes misunderstanding. He takes isolation, alienation, betrayal, struggle, physical pain, psychological pain, all of it culminating in the encounter with death itself. He takes that encounter, he takes death, death itself upon himself, in order to triumph over it by his death. In the Byzantine liturgy, we sing again and again and again throughout Pascha, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. He tramples down death by death. 
but he doesn't just do this in a mechanical sense. He takes upon himself our human condition and its fullness. He takes upon himself that condition in the mystery of love. And so that love for us becomes something... Why don't we open a window here so we don't uh, die? The kids are gone. Is that too cold? Not on okay. me. So he takes that love upon himself, his love for us, and that love is what transforms us. Not suffering for the sake of suffering, but a self-emptying love. The mystery of the exaltation of the cross is kenosis. And, and the great theme of Russian Christianity is that self-emptying, that humble, indeed humiliated love. And so to understand that first and foremost is to have an encounter with Christ that centers and grounds us for everything else that follows. Without that initial encounter that takes you and embraces you where you are, even in the worst of your life, with love, not looking at you as a bug under a microscope, but with love, divine and human, then everything else is a waste of time. Then Byzantine religi uh, Christianity can become a hobby, a private hobby, an elite little club for historical interests or for aesthetic interests. I'm interested in this. And then the clock is ticking before it just expires. Because who's interested except those that have a particular interest in, you know, maybe the 9th or 10th century or whatever. They're studying that at Stanford or they, they love the liturgical aesthetics. Um, but how does it impact the world of today? You know, if this is vital, if this is real, and it is if it's grounded in Christ, then it is perennially relevant and has something to say to us at the roots of our very existence. So the early fathers of the church and the early councils of the church, all of which were held in the East, in Byzantine Christianity, worked out, reflected upon what we know of Christ from what he revealed himself to us and to the apostles and beyond, precisely in order that this encounter with him might be possible and real for us in every day and age and for every human being. And it begins then with this mystery of the cross. The kenosis, which is the Greek word meaning the self-emptying and the humiliated love of God in Christ. If you want to know who God is, he is that figure, we don't have it here, but the figure of, of, of Christ descending from the cross and, 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 and being lowered into the tomb. Humiliated love, self-emptying love. And, and, and at that point, no one's left out. Because he, who could be uh, more out of it, as it were, more betrayed, rejected, humiliated, sorrowful, or suffering than he? No one. So he takes everything unto himself and says, you're all welcome, you're all inclusive into this mystery of love. The transfiguration that happens earlier is the contextualization of the cross for us. Basically what it does for us is what it did for the apostles, which is to prepare them for the mystery of the cross, to bring them into the meaning of that love. That love doesn't just get creamed by sinful humanity, it just doesn't get annihilated and killed and, and, and placed in a tomb. Yes, that happens, but remember, he tramples down death by death. He isn't conquered by death. He conquers death. He conquers death. And the tomb, therefore, the death and the tomb, are not the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection, where all is a triumphant victory, the victory of love. In anticipation of this mystery of the cross and the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, the Lord prepares his apostles for this mystery. The Son of Man will be betrayed. He will be killed. He prepares them for this great scandal of the cross. I talked about this in the homily today. This great love is for us a, a scandal sometimes. It's out of control. You know, we want to control the Lord. We want to say, you can't love us that much. Could you possibly? I mean, we, 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 we find it somehow almost irritating. Certainly the Pharisees did. You know what I mean? This scandalous love, self-emptying love. And in order to contextualize that 
in, inherent scandal, quote unquote, of the cross, Peter, James, and John are singled out among the twelve to experience the transfiguration. The transfiguration then gives us a connection then to the exaltation of the cross. The transfiguration early in the summer, whereas we wait until the cross, which, 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 which is a mini holy, great and holy week during, during the middle of summer, because of course we venerate the cross in holy week, you know, um, before thy cross we bow down and worship, O Master, thy holy resurrection we glorify. We sing that during great and, 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 and holy week, but we sing it again for, for the exaltation of the cross. Uh, so we're, we're already, as it were, in, in, in late summer, anticipating Great and Holy Week, Passion Week. But even before that, along with the Apostles, we have the Transfiguration to help us, to buffer for us in our weakness this mystery of humiliation, this mystery of betrayal, this mystery of crucifixion and of death and burial in a tomb. How could this happen to God? What does it mean? What does it say to you, and, for, and what does it mean for for us? Same thing that he meant that it meant for the apostles. It means resurrection, and the transfiguration is the preparation, prefigurement of the resurrection. In Byzantine Christianity, the transfiguration is especially a point, a focal point of reflection, meditation, contemplation, theological elaboration among the monks of Mount Athos and the monastic tradition in particular because it is a reflection on our destiny in and through the destiny of Christ. If we're baptized into Christ, we become him, members, living members of his body. What happened to him happens to us. What happens? This journey from death and through death to new life. What is that life? That life is beyond anything you can imagine. That life is going to blow you away. <laughs> the way if you look at the icon of the transfiguration, the apostles are blown away. You know, Peter is like <laughs> this. We, do we have the, do we have, no. we don't have it here. No. But, well, there's probably a little You see, see, it's very small. It's very small, yeah. You know. Sometimes you see it without the shoes falling off, too. The shoes are falling Their off. Their shoes are falling off because they're like drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Sober inebriation is what they call the fathers <laughs> in the church. They're not blown very away. Not very shady, in other words, term? Blown <laughs> away. it's a patristic term. It's a patristic term, actually, in the Greek fathers. Sober inebriation. Oh, they actually use that term? Yes. Oh, yeah. How fine. <laughs> the work of the spirit is sober inebriation. In other words, all your human calculations, your calculations of what joy is, of what meaning is, of what fulfillment is, are blown away because all those calculations are, are just out of the water compared to what God has prepared for you, which is beyond even your wildest hopes and dreams and imagination. So the apostles are like, they're, they're, they're down on the ground, symbolically represented in the icon, as, rep as, as experiencing something that's a sneak preview of Pascha, which is post which cross through the through the mystery of the cross. So you see, in the summertime, we're we're building up to this. We're commemorating these feasts, which are all about Christ. See, and His death is the focal point, to the extent that it leads us to resurrection, of which the transfiguration is the prefigurement, the sneak preview. The true part even talks about that in the transfiguration. It's far the one one of the lines that you're saying. As far as they can. As far as they can bear it. As much as they can stand. Human endurance, yeah. Yes, human endurance. Human understanding. That experience that they have. Human experience, yeah. the transfiguration. And why is it beyond human endurance and catered to that? Is because what they're experiencing is Christ. And who is he? Person, capital P, with both the divine and the human nature. He comes up, he's like anybody else. You know, and they go to the mountain, the next thing they know, he's transfigured before them. What, what, what are they experiencing? What? 
What kind of light is this? What does he say of himself? Does he say, I am filled with light? I am bright with light? No, he says, I am light. I am light itself. I am the light of the world. And what is that light? Uncreated light that manifests itself through his human nature to be able to connect with our human nature. That's why it blows their mind. That's why they can only endure so much. Because it's uncreated light. The uncreated grace of God. A partaking in the divine nature itself insofar as we are able to. The nature of God, of course, his essence, his divine essence, is completely incommunicable. Ineffable, incomprehensible, incommunicable, as we say. But the energies in Byzantine theology, the energies are like the rays of the sun that come from the sun itself that enable us to partake of its light and warmth and, and positive qualities. And so those energies are also uncreated, part of the uncreated, um, in this case, light of God, into which the apostles are partaking. Suddenly, all of the cells in their body and all of the aspects of their brain are filled and permeated with a divine energy. Everything that would happen in your life where you would think, aha, I get it. I understand this math problem. I understand this philosophical problem. I understand, you know, how this or that works mechanically in life. Everything in you that would say, aha, emotionally, I know what it is to fall in love. I know what it is to love and to be loved. I know what it is to be euphoric and joyful. All of that is brought together in this experience of the divine energies. Suddenly, everything has a new purpose and a new meaning, a new origin and a new goal for Peter, James, and John. And that's why they're scattered on the, on the, on the, on the, on the icon, because they're, they're overwhelmed with this. They're having a sneak preview of the goal for which they were created and have been redeemed and sanctified, which is Pascha itself. Resurrection, transformation. It's a little sneak preview, and it blows them away as, as far as they can humanly endure it. And so transfiguration for us is what prepares us to enter into the mystery. The scandal of the cross is only able to be understood and communicated if first you've had a foretaste of what happens through the cross and beyond the cross, which is resurrection. Okay. And that is a transformation, a transfiguration, not just of the Lord, that these apostles are witnessing, uh, again, something outside of themselves, but rather essentially in an interior process. Byzantine contemplative spirituality looks at the interior process. What does the encounter with Christ mean? Does it mean that I just think about him, write about him, talk about him? No, it, become, it, it means I become him. How so? By the power of his spirit, the breath of love, divine love itself. The only way that the apostles, Peter, James, and John, can experience this transfiguration of the Lord, that he becomes radiant with the very light of God, is that if they are in that radiance themselves, and that they, they themselves have already been transformed into that radiance insofar as human nature is, is, is capable of that. And so they are filled with something that they will later understand with the mystery of Pentecost, which is the cross reveals God and brings us to God as love itself, a self-emptying love. That the glory of God, however, cannot be grasped outside of that humility, outside of that self-emptying love. If I try to grasp this glory without this love, without the cross, then I screw up my whole spiritual life, and I become self-righteous and pride, prideful, and I, and I cling to religion for its own sake rather than God for his own sake. The, 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 the things of God, rather than the gifts of God for their sake, rather than, than the God of those gifts. The perennial temptation of, 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 of religion itself in general. And so the mystery of the cross and the transfiguration go together to lead us to Pascha and to the final fruits of Pascha, which is, which is, which is um, uh, Pentecost, 
the first fruits after the risen Lord has ascended and returned to the Father, the gift of the Spirit, which is the gift of the Father through the risen Son, glorified Son, who enables us to live this life of Christ, which is the life of love, to become he whom we receive in baptism and the Eucharist itself. And so all of these mysteries are about Christ. They're all about Christ. And our only access to Christ is through the incarnation itself. The Jesuit father Karl Rahner was asked one time after the council in the 70s, well, how come we don't ever talk about the mother of God anymore? This was in the West particularly. And he said, because we've, because we've made of the incarnation an abstraction, and he said, abstractions don't need a mother. <laughs> if Christ is an abstraction, we don't need to talk about his mother. Abstractions, a concept doesn't need a mother. The mother keeps this real, keeps the incarnation real. Human flesh, human blood, human heart. This, this is the, the mystery of the human nature. So that this... So that these divine energies might be communicated to us in and through the human, the material, the visible, the sacramental. Christ's sacred humanity is the vehicle for all of those sacramental realities uh, that will later be communicated throughout the history of the church. To what end? To what end? For a new world. For a new world. The mother of God, the Theotokos, is not a private devotion, as is often the case in the West, where, depending upon the peculiarities of an individual's temperament or ethnic background, they have more or less devotion to her. If you're Mexican, Guadalupe, if you're Polish, just the Hova, uh, whatever, you know, then people can say, oh yeah, that makes sense because you're, you're from this ethnic group, you know. No, in Byzantine Christianity, she is an essential part of the goal of the Incarnation, which is that Christ forms to himself members of his body. And those members of his body become the new Israel, the new Jerusalem. And in the end, what it really is all about, all of these stories that we hear in the Word of God throughout Genesis, from Genesis to the book of Revelation, is a love story. Who wants to be outside of a love story? Wouldn't you rather be inside than outside of a love story? You know? Because suddenly, your mind and your whole inner being is exploding with this uncreated life and light and love of God that the apostles experienced in the Transfiguration. And what is the love story ultimately than the relationship between God and his people? Between Christ and his bride, the church. And so the Theotokos, precisely in her maternal role, also takes on the symbolic role, the embodiment of what this new people is supposed to be, which is in a love relationship, a covenant relationship, if you will, a bridal relationship with the bridegroom. And so the whole point of this is, is this new kind of relationship with God himself, which the Theotokos reveals and embodies in her own person, not distinct from us, but showing us an image of ourselves, as if we're looking in, your, in a mirror and seeing yourself. And so in the liturgical calendar throughout these months, her, her, the beginning and the end of her life as such, as the church, is there in the Nativity, September 8th, and then, and we're, we're not speaking chronologically because we're talking about a new liturgical year here, and then in her end and glorification, which is the Dormition of the Theotokos. The Byzantine liturgical calendar begins on September 1st. In the Roman Church, it begins on the first Sunday of Advent. So September 1st, in the Gregorian calendar, would be the, the new beginning. So this would be the first feast of the new liturgical year is birth. The birth of who? The one who is the church to be. The new Jerusalem. Who's that? You! <laughs> you! You! <laughs> She's showing you a picture of yourself as uh, the, collectively the church as bride that is able to say yes. That is able to participate as the liturgical hymns 
and texts of her feast for Great Vespers and the Divine Liturgy tell us the feast of overcoming the alienation and isolation from God that existed before. To overcome the barrenness of her parents, Joachim and Anna. To overcome the corruption of, of, of death and the grave that came from the first parents, Adam and Eve. She overcomes that barrenness. She overcomes that corruption, which we sing in the hymns of that day. She's the, first, she's the beginning, the first fruits of a new life, of a new cosmos. The meaning of all that is, not in and of herself, but is the one who makes it possible by keeping the incarnation real, by making Christ possible, who is the one who is that new life itself. What is the terminal point of this beginning? The last feast of the liturgical year before we start a new one, which is our feast, not just hers, our feast, where we see where we're meant to be. But through the cross, Guided by the transfiguration, which gives us that hope of uncreated grace in our lives, living our baptism, becoming Christ, but through the, taking it even to the cross, through that cross, death for us is trampled down. Corruption, the end of the cross, becomes not corruption but a new beginning, and we share in the resurrection, which is in the very life of God himself. That through uncreated grace, we partake in that life of the divine nature. As St. Peter said, we become partakers, sharers in the divine nature insofar as it is possible for us. Not in the essence of God, but in, in the energies of God through that grace. And so this participation in the life of God is seen in the sneak preview for us of each of us as members of the church, which is her dormition, her death, her, if you will, sharing in the resurrection and glorification of her son. She is assumed, she, she shares in the passage from this life to the next within the light of, within the life of the Paschal mystery, Pascha itself, shares in the death and moves into the glory of resurrection, where everything is included, where nothing is left out. Just as the apostles first felt this glory here in a limited term, Resurrection is, the, is beyond hope, all hopes and dreams. It, it fulfills all of our needs of mind, of body, of heart, and of soul. Full glorification. Full glorification. At this point, we're beyond religion as simply a hobby. We're beyond religion as simply ritual formality. We're beyond religion as something that can be manipulated by socio-political agendas of the moment of a, of a party in one country or another. We're into Christ himself and what he alone offers us, which is access to the very life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Theotokos then is venerated through these mysteries because we are in her, the, the, the church, as as, as the bride of the bridegroom. And so a lot happens in August and September in these, in these marvelous feasts. And we enter into the mystery of God coming to us where we are, as I said before, through a, a, a term that the Greek fathers use, which is antinomy. Antinomy is sort of like paradox. It's two things that seem opposite can be happening at the same time. Like I said, with the nativity um, of the Theotokos, we sing that she has overcome, the, her birth overcomes the barrenness of her parents, Joachim and Anna. She overcomes, she begins a new life that overcomes in her son the corruption, death and the grave and corruption of the first parents and those who inherit that, Adam and Eve. In the Dormition, we sing that, that she, she is a virgin, virgin in her birth giving. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that marvelous mystery where she is mother and virgin at the same time. Virginal in her integrity and her oneness with God, but fruitful, maternal in that virginity and virginal in that maternity. And that as she leaves us and enters into this transit, transitus, falling asleep and transition from this life to the next, she dies, she leaves us, but she's closer to us than ever before. She does not forsake the world through her intercessory prayer, through her presence. She transcends in the mystery of the resurrection, her sharing in that Pascha of her son, the boundaries of time and space to which we are bound before our death and glorification, our sharing in the full fullness of the resurrection of the Lord. 
And so when we see her, we see the goal, the destiny. You ever wonder, what's it all about? Why am I doing this? Oh, God. <laughs> this is it. 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 All of these four great or major feasts of the Byzantine liturgical year. They end the year, they begin the year in the months uh, that we had this hiatus of the, of the lectures. So I wanted to take the time then to, to go through them, to explain a little bit of these mysteries grounded in Christ so that, um, so that we have this sense of, um, of what we're all about as church, as Byzantine church. And uh, the mystery of Christ, and the mystery of the Theotokos. The uncreated light of God becomes accessible to us through his energies. And that light is his life, and that life is love itself. Divine and human, brought together, distinct but inseparable, in the person of Christ. That incarnation is concretized, is made real, is no longer an abstract concept in the person and mission of the Mother of God from her nativity to her dormition and beyond, her intercessory role for us. That's why we pray to her so often during the liturgy as the center of the communion of saints. And what makes all of this accessible to us then as the fruit of our baptism is Eucharist, where we become he whom we receive. In the Eucharist, we don't just read about or hear about the Transfiguration as a past historical event. Our baptism enables us to enter into that door beyond the catechumens to full reception of the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, the transfigured Christ that the apostles saw, yes, intimately, but not totally, we, through faith, enter into that mystery and become that mystery totally. So if you ever think to yourself, gee, if I had been there with Peter, James, and John, wouldn't that have been marvelous? Wow, I wonder what that would have been like. You know, and you can razzle-dazzle a Cecil B. DeMille production all you want. You know, Ignatian, sometimes spirituality can be misunderstood to enter into that kind of, you know, meditation. No, through faith, you are there. Every time you receive the Eucharist, you're receiving the transfigured Christ. You're having a greater experience, not necessarily emotionally, but through faith, objectively, a greater intimacy with Christ than Peter, James, and John did at the historical moment of the transfiguration. Because you're entering with Mary through her nativity, through her dormition and beyond, as a member of the church, like she is the model of that church in its final perfection, you're entering into the mystery of the self-emptying love of Christ who gives himself to you completely through the cross so that you can completely in the resurrection share in the glory, the life, the fullness of the divine nature by participation of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit now and always and through ages of ages forever. Amen. 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 So, wow. <laughs> God overdoes it. <laughs> is this helpful is this helpful um, does this help make sense of some of these feasts yeah. mm -hmm. well a lot of these texts you also find in the vesper services where if you listen to the text or can read the text there's these correlations that are going on they're explaining all these right. things that, that you don't get in divine liturgy you right. might get a tropa or a Kentuckian that will say some of this, but really the meat of uh, liturgical life is the hymnography of Vespers and right. you know, that really teaches you right. all this and is very self explanatory and, and very thoughtful in, in theology. Actually. Yeah. There's an old Latin expression, lex orandi, yes. lex credendi. And in the Byzantine liturgy especially, this is true, as the deacon was saying, in the, you have three readings at Great Vespers, which are drawn from the Old Testament, that really have a rich explanation of the symbolic prefigurement of, say, the Dormition of the Theotokos. Uh, because people will sometimes say, Protestants will sometimes say, where's that in the Bible? The, the whole of the Old Testament is, is, a, is a preparation for Christ. 
And so all of these rich stories, these rich symbols, Jacob's ladder, for example, you know, uh, would be an example of, 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 of the mystery of Christ and the mystery of the Theotokos is making his presence possible. So the prayer of the church then determines um, the, uh, the faith of the church. Hence, if you start playing with this and watering this down, you end up watering down the faith of the, of the people. So the Byzantine liturgy has not been tampered with or watered down in the last 50 years, so it still has the same centuries-old richness of the liturgical, the Tropara, the Troparia, Contakia, which are liturgical hymns, the readings at Vespers from the Old Testament, all of these, the, litur the gospel texts and re first reading the epistle reading, all of these together of great Vespers and of a divine liturgy for a major feast collectively tell you what the church believes, not to mention the iconography of the church itself, which also visually sort of a sacramental um, is the gospel in visual form as well. So it's a very rich catechetical expression of the faith in and of itself. Yes. Since the Second World War, churches built in America were bleached of aesthetic, artistic expression right. of credendi and arandi both. Right. That's that's why a lot of people are drawn to orthodoxy, and a lot just for went Protestant because that's thoroughly bleached. Some of some of the some of the converts to Byzantine Catholicism or orthodoxy really come from yeah. Protestantism because if they came from a Calvinist background where where there was absolutely no none of this at all of everything that I just yeah. talked about, where you know then then there's something in their spiritual DNA they're being starved to death. And, and you can only be starved to death so long, and then you want to be liberated and have a good meal. And that's what people find in, in Byzantine Christianity, and Eastern and general Christianity. And this is apostolic. In other words, this, is, this wasn't just made up in the Middle Ages. It's, a, it's an ongoing yeah. tradition, yes, of embellishment and adding through reflection, but it's, 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 it's the fruit of the great fathers, doctors mm -hmm. of the church, monks, mystics, the great... Uh, testimony of men and women martyrs. All of this is an ongoing expression of original apostolic Christianity. And it's the liturgy described in the New Testament. In the book of on Revelation. On the first day of in the, the book week, of we gather on the first day of the week right, right, yeah, for yeah. the breaking of the bread. Right. Have you ever heard this in other parishes? I mean, this kind of synthesis of these, you know, you're not going to get this uh, anywhere else. This just is Christology. Huh? Just studying Christology. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. not so much in connection to the feasts. Yeah. And the feasts are the it's celebration of Christology. Otherwise, Christology becomes yeah, right. an academic course yep. that you're taking at USF or something. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Or at the seminary. It makes it real. Yeah. You're experiencing, that's why we said you become he whom you receive. All of the mysteries of Christ you receive in that Eucharist. And so you're not just studying it, you're experiencing it the same way, the, in an even greater way that the apostles experienced it at, uh, at uh, Mount Tabor, uh, at the Transfiguration. How? <coughs> By the Spirit. If the, if the Son is the only begotten of the Father, the immortal word, image, and word of the Father, then the Spirit is the, well, Spiritus in Latin, is, Latin means breath. He is the, the very breath of the Father. He is the, the, the love of the Father. And so the Son and the Spirit are the dual gifts of the Father. And so in Byzantine Christianity, there is this marvelous relationship where, where Christianity isn't just Christological, 
That's a, that's that, you can get that impression in some evangelical. It's all about Jesus, Jesus. But 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 with, without the Spirit, there is no assimilation in our lives of the Son. So it's Christological and pneumatological, pneumatic in in business Christianity as well. When we breathe on the water to consecrate it for baptism, it's the breath of the Spirit that we invoke. And what does the person receive in baptism through that water? The power of the Holy Spirit. What does the Spirit do? Imprints Christ, the Son, upon the soul of that individual. When we invoke the Holy Spirit three times, no less, in the in the uh, Epiclesis and the Byzantine liturgy, what are we asking? That the Spirit descend upon for the transformation of material creation, bread and wine, into the very presence of Christ, his body and blood. And that the Spirit then complete that by having us not just receive that body and blood, but become he whom we receive. We ask for the communion of the Holy Spirit, evidence through remission of sins, the purification of soul, the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven. How do all those things happen? through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the communion of the Holy Spirit, which unites us to God and therefore to one another in and through Christ. Communion, oneness with. So the gift of the Spirit is the completion of the mission of the Son within us at the subjective level of personal assimilation. And the church is at the center and the point of all of this. So the Theotokos isn't competing with all of this as, as the embodiment of the church. She, she's smack in the center of this reality of receiving the spirit, being the spirit bearer, who therefore becomes the Christ bearer, the, the one who is the birth giver, the one who is God. And all of that, these gifts of the, of the Father uh, allow for us to attain to his kingdom. Not a geographical place in another time, but that which is in time but beyond time and isn't a place other than your own heart where God chooses to dwell. The kingdom of God is the spirit in you. The mystery of the Trinity, therefore, in you. Heaven is already here if you choose it. And so the mystery of the cross and Pascha, resurrection, Paschal mystery, prefigured by transfiguration is already a living reality because of our Eucharist. The Holy Spirit is also invoked at the offering, the blessing of water. The, it's invoked three times right. the blessing of water right. before um, the cross is born. Yeah. If you another time which was if you've ever asked a, if you've ever asked a Latin priest to bless holy water for you and he goes like that <laughs> and then he's gone <laughs> go to the blessing of waters at theophany and, and set aside 40 minutes <laughs> at least because it's rich with the breathing the exorcism you know all of this is, is, is you know is all this love there's an antithetical dimension which is the opposition to this love so we believe also that they're evil energies and spirits so there is an exorcism uh, you in the name of Christ against any matter anything elements of material creation that we remove those in the name of, of, of the Trinity and then they are that they are replaced by this invocation epiclesis descent of the Holy Spirit upon this water and then the benefits are listed of all of this spiritually spiritually and physically which are which are tremendous so it's a very rich um, Lexarondi that lets, leads then to a very richer, deeper faith in all of these mysteries, which are not concepts anymore or academic topics, but become lived experiences, beginning with that encounter with Christ made possible by the Spirit. And what's frustrating is, is that people Everybody out here, what they're really searching for deep down inside at a subconscious level more than anything else is all of this. They might not be able to articulate it, but this is the terminal point, the goal of all human desire and energies and yearning and hopes and dreams. You just wish that, that this treasure could be shared with, with more people, you know. 
And, and one temptation is to say, well, I have to be going out to the peripheries and endless tasks, endless busyness. I need to be out in the Golden Gate Park, and then I need to run over across the bay, and then I need to do this and this and this and pass out leaflets and talk and do all these projects and plan. Well, you exhaust yourself in six months, and then you're dead at the end of that. I mean, <laughs> those things can be good. I'm not saying they're, they're good, but they can never be a replacement for. They're a fruit of, but never a replacement for the primary goal of all this, which is interior transformation by the means of, again, the Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit transforms material elements, water, bread and wine, so he transforms you, your heart. St. Seraphim of Sarah, the great Russian mystic, said, acquire the Holy Spirit, and a thousand souls around you will be saved, just by who you are. I quote this a lot in other contexts that Ryan knows, in Western contexts, to, to say that the first thing that needs to change is you, and then by who you are, that you radiate a spiritual energy. Um, in the West, Thomas Merton said this, you become like, like these great trees that just purify the air by their very existence, these wonderful redwoods. You know, he's talking about true contemplatives. St. Francis, Francis of Assisi, said this similar thing when he said, always preach the gospel. Sometimes, if necessary, use words. So the interior life becomes very important in this, in this spirituality, not as an escape from changing the world, but as the very means for authentically changing it. So we've moved then beyond the tension between activity and passivity, between liberal and conservative, between religionist dogmatic concepts and, and simply ethics or ritual formalism. We bring all of that together in a unified way, in an authentic way, in the mystery of, of the Father's love, which through his gifts of both Son and Spirit lead us to become the church, which is humanity renewed, humanity brought back again and restored to its original creative plan, oneness with God, God's creative, saving, and sanctifying plan, which includes the whole cosmos, which includes, which does make theological sense of caring for the environment. You know, that that's not just a liberal political term although it can be used that way, unfortunately, nowadays, because that's the only ways in which people think. But the great monks like Seraphim of Sarab would have been, you know, they, they had an inner life whereby the bears, wild bears, would come up to them and they were automatically tamed and they would eat out of his hand. He had some mystical sense of connectedness to, to this. And what does this do? It takes us back to what is described in the Theotokos, that she overcomes the original barrenness, the dead end of Adam and Eve, expelled from paradise, that we go back to an original state. We have that state created anew, anew for us, where oneness with and harmony with all of material creation is restored. And that the isolation and alienation of sin and the consequences of sin are overcome. May I ask something? Mm -hmm. Could you give the Teotokos the first of the three O's? Oh, they, oh, there you go. I get excited and my spelling gets bad. There you go. They all talk. She appreciates that. They all talk. Thank you. So there you go. So I find this a compelling spiritual vision that makes sense of my life and the life of the world, not because I think so, but because God has revealed it in his love and invites us to see, to understand, joyfully accept, be grateful for, and live this experience through the encounter with the Son of the Father in the power of the Spirit, and in that to be guided by the maternal love, prayers, intercession of the Theotokos, who helps us get through the mystery of the cross, so that in that cross we discover that self-emptying love is in fact the resurrection itself, that, that it's already there love. Now, always, and forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 We talked about that at lunchtime. I know. Yeah. It said people have it in them, but they haven't discovered it yet. 
Jesus. This is it, the goal, the meaning of it all.